Today on the We Invested podcast, we have Chris Odegaard, and he is the founder and CEO of The Prolific Investor, as well as the author of Get Off Your and Manage Your Money, Why We Why You Need Alternative Investments. Chris, how are you doing today? I'm fantastic. How are you, Wesley? Thanks for having I'm me. Doing, yes, sir. Thank you for joining us. I'm excited about this one. Yeah, That's it's going to be fun. Lots of, we got lots of good stuff to talk about. <laughs> yes, sir. For sure. For sure. So let's just kind of start from the beginning um and you know talk a little bit about where you grew up and and what that was like for you now i grew up in a middle middle class family in the suburbs of cincinnati ohio a little town called forest park and um uh, you know after high school uh went off to college um basically to be an airplane well i actually went to kind of went to technical school to be an airplane mechanic uh, airframe and power plant mechanic as we call it in the in the industry. So I went to a place called Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University down in Daytona Beach, Florida. And uh, I didn't really want to, the uh, last thing I wanted to do was go to college, but I always liked working with my hands. And I thought this, and I liked airplanes. I thought this, this will be cool. And my dad really wanted me to go to Embry-Riddle as opposed to other places, because he said, you know, if some if some miracle occurs, you know, and you happen to go on in another, another couple of years, you could actually get a, a bachelor's degree. And I just wanted to go work on airplanes and get my uh, and in the U.S., you have to have a, what's the FAA's airframe and power plant license. So that's the goal. You go down there to the school, you get your license, and you go work on airplanes. And uh, anyway, I loved it, working with my hands, working on airplanes, and a miracle did happen, and I did go on and, and get a bachelor's degree. And then I never actually uh, worked as a mechanic. I got hired on at the Kennedy Space Center down at the, uh, right around the time the first shuttle launches were going off, and I worked down there as a, an associate engineer was my title. But uh, I didn't know anything about rockets. I learned about airplanes. So a friend of mine had, uh, that I went to school with down at Embry-Riddle had gotten uh, hired at Boeing out in Seattle. And so I got an interview and I went out there and that's where I worked for the next 33 and a half years. And so that's kind of that's kind of that part of the story. And I did, I did all kinds, it was a great job. I did all kinds of things. Uh, you know, I worked in the factory. I traveled all over the world as a technical representative. I've been to 33 countries. At the height of my career, I was the director of contracts, and I wrote and negotiated the contracts for the sale of Boeing airplanes to airlines all over the world, and one king. <laughs> so, uh, no, that, I mean, it sounds like you have a very interesting, you know, um, backstory. Uh, you know, you kind of lived all over the U.S. And, and traveled all over the world, as you mentioned. So, you know, throughout your travels and and um, you know, just you know, throughout your career, what do you think are some of the biggest you know, or, or most impactful lessons that you've learned throughout your career and throughout your travel? Well, uh, you know, life is a, life is a team sport and it's all about relationships. And especially when I was, you know, sitting across the table negotiating with, you know, airlines for the sale of multiple hundred million dollar planes. And, uh, you know, we would have agreements and disagreements, but at the end of the day, you know, we would get there, we'd get there in a, in a, in a polite manner. And I had to, and tell people no, and sometimes hell no, but there was always good rationale. And you know what, we always walk away from those things. And I still keep in touch with some of those, some of those people today, but it, I really learned how big business works. Um, you know, um, you know, there's a, there's a contract that we sign when, when you buy an airplane, it is very big and everything that happens surrounding that airplane, all the way from how it's configured, everything that happens from, from the signing of that contract that comes after that, you know, it, it ties back to some language or some terms in there. Uh, so that was, um, you know, that was, uh, it was just, it was, I call it an MBA on steroids. You know, I like to say, I, I got my undergraduate down at Embry-Riddle, well, I never got a graduate degree. I like to say that just for the hell of it, but you know, that, that job was, uh, more valuable than any, you know, college class. But I, I, I guess to answer your question, it's about the relationships. You know, you, everything you do in life is with and through other people. So. Yes, sir. I agree with that 1000%. Um, you know, and just to kind of focus on where we are today, you know, just kind of bring it up to speed or, or get a little bit more current. What is, you know, the prolific investor? Yeah. So um, I used to be, uh, I guess we could first talk about, you know, there's two main categories of investments. You have, on one hand, you've got conventional investments. That's pretty much where most Americans are. Everything is publicly traded, stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. 
And then you have alternatives. And those are the things, pretty much everything that's not publicly traded. And that would be things like every, every you know, uh, subclass of real estate from apartment buildings to single family rentals, self-storage. And then the other things, you know, uh, crypto and precious metals. Um, if you were a private lender, that would be alternative investment business equipment like ATM machines or earth moving equipment, somebody has to own those things. And lots of times they're leased out. And, um, and believe it or not, cash value life insurance is a great, uh, a great alternative investment and uh, shares in businesses, but private shares. So non publicly traded shares. So all those things are alternatives. And what's funny is, um, you know, when people, uh, when you go to your stockbroker and he says, or your, or your financial planner, and he's going to build you a balanced portfolio, it's not balanced at all. You're all in paper assets. Everything that you own is a paper representation of something. And where I invest, I can actually go kick the tires and the brick on something that, that I invested in. So, so anyway, those are, those are the two major categories. And the prolific investor, I'm all about writing and teaching people about what alternatives are and why they're so superior to the conventional investments, which again is the stock bonds and mutual funds. No, and I think that's a great way to put it in a, a great um, description for what our alternative investment is. Um, because there's nothing quite like being able to go in and physically touch your asset or yeah. your investment. Sure. You know, and if you have a if you have a mutual fund or a stock, you say you have a stock, your ownership is represented by a piece of paper. Uh, and companies can go out of business and that ownership can go to zero. But if I have complete ownership or partial ownership in a hundred unit of an apartment building, that thing never goes to zero. It doesn't disappear. It's always there. It's insured against loss. So I've got something, and there's dirt there underneath it, you know? So you actually have a real thing that can't just disappear like a, like a paper representation of, of an asset. Yes, sir. For sure. For sure. And so, you know, uh, one of the other things that I mentioned earlier is that you're also an author and, you know, mm -hmm. you have a new book out and, um, you know, I just wanted to ask you, you know, what was the vision or the inspiration behind writing, get off your blank and manage your money? <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> well, so when I, when I left the corporate world, uh, I don't, you, I don't like to say, uh, I don't like to say retire because the definition of retire is to be taken out of service. And I'm far from not being in service. So I like to say that I fired the man, you know, back in 2018, we parted company. And uh, that's when I started the blog, The Prolific Investor. And, you know, I'm trying to, uh, you know, the state of um, the average American's finances are terrible. Most people don't have a clear path to retirement at a young age or at an old age. And so, um, so this is, I guess this is part of the story. And, in 2000, you know, I was on what I call the, uh, the, I was a conventional investor most of my life. I was on the, what I call the 401k highway to mediocrity. I was on this long, slow path to, to this mediocre place where someday uh, I might retire. And um, because that's all I knew. That's what my parents knew. Most people, we just kind of come out of the womb program that you know, this 401k thing is how you do it. There's not that many pensions around anymore. And in 2009, in my mid 40s, I had this, uh, what I call an illiquidity event, where I lost 55% of my assets with the stroke of a pen and thousands of dollars a month in cash flow. And in my case, it happened to be a divorce. So here I am in my mid 40s, and that mediocre path just got even way more mediocre. And um, if I was ever going to, you know, not work again, uh, I was going to have to find a different path. And uh, some, somewhere a little bit before that, a friend of mine had recommended a book to me. And I bought the book and I sat it on the bookshelf for way too long. And <clears throat> I finally picked it up when I was going someplace on an airplane. I read it and the book was Rich Dad, Poor Dad, of course, by Robert Kiyosaki. And he's all about real estate and other alternatives. And that kind of lit a fire under me to leave the conventional investing behind and move into alternatives. And nine years later, I went from a 55% loss to making that 55% up and multiplying it many times over. And I fired the man and I never have to work again if I don't want to. And anyway, to answer the long answer to your question is I started the prolific investor to share what I learned along the way. And kind of out of that, after doing the blog for a few years, uh, I had a business coach and she asked me, you know, can you write a book? And I said, 
sure, I can write a book. And I, you know, I've got 40 articles on my site. I've already got, you know, I just got to re kind of reorganize those chapters and put them together. And, uh, and so this has been out just about two and a half weeks now. Oh, you can see the title, but we, we don't say it. But uh, anyway, so this is, this is to introduce people to alternative investments and tell them why they're superior. And I used real example. I use a real example of one of my alternative investments in each one of these comparisons. Uh, so I use real numbers. No, that's amazing. And I think that's a great, uh, you know, a very inspirational story, you know, is, is being able to take something you know, take a negative event or a negative occurrence and, and see the positive in it or even turn it into a positive event. So, yeah, it's um, it's been a, yeah, it's it's been a great it's been a great journey. And, you know, you were asking me uh, kind of, you know, kind of some of the things I've learned. And one of the coolest things about the journey of just all the people that I've met, you know, you know, investing is a team sport as well. So, you know, I, I network with lots of different investors who are all doing the same kind of thing and just have met some incredible people that I can call up and say, hey, I thought I understood how this thing worked, but I really don't, you know, maybe you can help me out. And so, yeah, so it's been a lot of fun. Yes, sir. And something, you know, you just mentioned was the title of the book. And that's something <laughs> that I definitely wanted to ask you about. So, you know, can you talk a little bit more about how you came up with the name for this book and what was the thought process behind it? I think it's a, yeah. I think it's a great name, by the way, too. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm trying to think if I had I, I can't actually remember if I had any other titles or not. But I would my we I was still living back in Seattle. My girlfriend and I were taking one of our long walks at one of the trails that we normally walk to. And I had and so I through my training with self-publishing school, I've been told, look, the title is supposed to do two things. It's supposed to get your attention and it's supposed to tell the readers exactly what the book is out. So the get off your a dollar sign dollar sign is the attention getting thing and and then manage your money why you need alternative investments says hey this is about money personal finance and a different way of investing so we were just we were walking on the trail one day and I just spit this out, you know, which just kind of you know divine intervention. you know. <laughs> No, and it's definitely a great name. Definitely, definitely an attention getter, mm -hmm. you know, and it has that that kind of action verb in there to let you know you need to get active and start moving and do what you need to do. Right, right. <laughs> yes, sir. So, um, you know, you were talking a little bit about, um, you know, working with with different people to uh, form this book and put it together. But how was the process of writing this book for you? And I guess what insights did you receive while working on this book and, and putting it all together? Um, so I uh, so I kind of wrote the first draft of this book in about, uh, you know, kind of between uh, Christmas and New Year's back in 20, 2019. Yeah, in 2019. So, you know, in a week or two, I, 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 I banged out the draft and, you know, I thought it was it was pretty good. And. Um, and I, I sent it out to a, a two or three friends of mine, and they kind of said, Chris, uh, you're trying to do something here, but we don't know what it is. And so, you know, they basically sent me back to the drawing board, uh, rewriting it, and, you know, and I doubled the size of the book. And then uh, my poor girlfriend, she has read almost every word of this book as many times as I have. So it was, it was just a, you know, back and forth, writing a chapter, you know, having somebody look at it. And, um, and then eventually you get to a, a higher professional editor who goes, who goes through it. And um, I'm embarrassed to say all the stuff I didn't know about grammar and punctuation that, you know, that I, that I found out I didn't know going through her. But it's, uh, you know, it was just a really interesting process. And like I said, it's just, uh, and, 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 I, and during, during, I actually moved from, and I, so I moved from Seattle to South Carolina in May. So this book got, put on put on the shelf for probably a month or two while that move happened and it was one of the better things that ever happened to me because when I picked it up again I was like oh you know I, I just you know I having let it sit for a while all of a sudden I was like well this chapter needs to beef up and this one is in the wrong place and so it's just kind of a it's, it's a process over time and you can't really can't really rush it and and, you know, just taking time and putting it down every once in a while and kind of, you know, like a fine wine, just let it marinate for a while, the age a little bit makes it better, you know, so that's kind of the way it was. Exactly. And it's like you get the chance to look at the, the same thing with fresh eyes, you know? Yeah. Yep. 
so you know once you finally got this book completed and you went through the editing process and you had the name picked out you had the cover um the cover art for the book done you know what emotions were you feeling once it was all finally complete and you you know got the book in your hands it was it was a it was a great feeling even even today you know i don't know what it is i sit here and you know it's a it's a it's a it's a short book it's 120 pages you can read it you can sit down and read this in two hours and uh but i sit here and i always have one nearby me and i go you know what i i created this you know there's not there's not another thing out there like it and i think it looks good uh, the reviews on Amazon, except for one, <laughs> there's one scathing review on Amazon. I don't know what I did to piss this guy off, but all the other ones are, are just uh, glowingly really positive ab about it. Um, so it, it was a great feeling when it was finally published and it was so much, uh, you know, the writing, the editing, and then there's the formatting. You have to have a the cover designer also formats the paper version and the and the ebook version and things kind of get moved around and I was so glad to have it done and just get that part of it behind me and now it's all about marketing the book so this is actually the easier part you know talking to guys like you uh, who've got an audience and sharing the message this is it's it's nice this is a little bit more relaxing than the, you know the the continual writing and editing and revising Yes, sir. But I know it's a I know it's a very proud moment. So, you know, did you ever in a million years think that you would be the author of a book and think that you would be here at this point today? <laughs> well, you know, um, I've always liked writing. Uh, I've got a binder of stuff that I've uh, sent to different newspapers and, and letters to the editor and things like that. And, you know, a little bit of poetry. So I always liked writing. And I actually uh, I, I thought about writing a book, you know, about 20 years ago. And it didn't really get off the ground, but I really wasn't. Um, uh, one of the big things I've learned is that I can't do everything by myself. You know, I have a bookkeeper that does the keeps the books. I've got a CPA that does my taxes. I've got an editor, a book designer. I, I joined a place called the Self Publishing School. So I'm now just like you know, if you needed to, um, if you want to become a doctor and do brain surgery, you have to get some training. So every everything in life now, I go okay, well, who can I get me to help with this, whether I, I pay them or not? And so now I, I get things done a lot quicker because I don't, you know, if, if it's a 12 step process, I don't need to know what the 12 steps are. I just need to take them one at a time. And if I need to bring in an outside consultant on every step to help me, that's okay. Yes, sir. No, and that's, that's a great point that you make. But, you know, before we move on to that aspect of it, I just wanted to kind of take it back a little bit to um, alternative investments. And, you know, you mentioned that you could kick yours earlier. So what is there a specific alternative um, investment that you like to focus on? Is there one that's your favorite? Yep. What are your thoughts on that? My favorite alternative investment is apartment buildings. Um, and, and so if you look you, through this pan, you know, technology is doubling every 18 months, according to a book I read. And so we, I tend to look back at my grandparents and think, look what they saw in their lifetime. That's nothing compared to the change that you and I have seen in our lifetimes. And so, um, shoot now, sorry, what did you, what did you just ask me? The, uh, yeah, we were just talking about apartment buildings, your favorite. Oh, apartment, event. yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, jobs are being displaced by technology, but there isn't, I don't see a, a technology on the horizon that's going to eliminate the, play, the, you know, people's need to have a place to sleep every night and spend time with their family and have a roof over their head. Now, there can always be cycles, but there's no technology that we know of that's going to make that go away. So there's always, there, people need dirt, there needs to be a building on it. So it's, I just like it because I take that risk uh, off, off the table. And, uh, you know, we, we're kind of switching back and forth now. We, we used to be more of a, of a homeowner society, and now we're turning a little bit more toward a renter society. And people are leaving various regions of the country and going to other places. And so I like apartment buildings in those regions where people are moving to now, well, people are moving there because the companies are moving there too. They're leaving California, they're leaving Seattle, they're, ne they're leaving New York, and they're going to Texas and Nevada and, and Georgia and places like that. So I like to be in those places where people are coming in. Yes, sir. And I think that's a, a great perspective to give the people, you know, as to why you like what you like and, uh, you know, just some supporting 
reasons and facts behind, you know, why what you do and the type of investing that you do can be very successful. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, you know, and, and real estate is hyper local. Right. So, you know, I just mentioned I just mentioned three different states. Right. But, you know, Nevada and Texas and Georgia and I don't know if I said Arizona, but it's not there. It's OK. It's it's Las Vegas and it's Dallas and it's Houston and it's Atlanta and it's the Phoenix metro area. So, you know, every every little market is different. So it's a, it's a real estate can be a, a great uh, stable way to make money but you have to be you can't buy it with the push of a button it's illiquid so if you make a mistake you're stuck with it right mm -hmm. so it, it has a downside too uh you got to be smarter for sure um you know and when i was um you know doing my research on you and, and checking your history i saw a pretty cool fact that i wanted to bring up um you know is that you pay zero dollars in federal income taxes in 2019 yep. you know i think that's amazing so <laughs> you know it, if you feel comfortable talking about it, yeah. you know, how, how did you accomplish that? So um, there's a, there's a, everything I know about taxes, I learned from the smartest tax guy in the country. He's a guy named Tom Wheelwright and Tom Wheelwright wrote a, wrote a book called uh, Tax-Free Wealth. It's sitting right behind me. And um, what Tom would say is that, that, you know, 90% of the tax code is telling you how to pay less taxes. 10% of the code, it says, okay, but you got to pay. The other 90% is telling you, maybe even more than 90%, is telling you how to pay less taxes. And the tax code is just a series of incentives. And so, uh, you know, uh, I, I wrote an article on my blog, and it was kind of a, it's my best business partner ever. It was blog 39, and the best business partner ever is the IRS. Because what the, what the government, you know, they use the tax uh, you know, the, the tax uh, incentive, rules as incentive. So if you partner with the government and do the things that the government thinks are good for the economy and the country, you get better tax treatment. So let's just take the conventional investor who invests in stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. He, put, he or she, that, that investor puts their money at risk to help drive the economy through their investments, right? And, and if they hold that investment for more than 12 months before they, I think it's 12 months, yeah, before they sell it, they get taxed at a 15% tax rate. That's better than a W-2 tax rate of like 24%. So the government is rewarding conventional investors. Now, for me, when I invest in an apartment building, uh, real estate comes with something called depreciation. So I could, I could make I have had situations where I've made a hundred thousand dollar investment in a, in a piece of real estate and received a one hundred thousand dollar write off. So that means the next hundred thousand dollars that comes in of the, the same type of income is not taxed at all. And so uh, what happened with me in 2019 is um, uh, I, I took a I took a one hundred thousand dollar. I created a tax problem for myself. I, I took a hundred thousand dollar distribution from a four hundred one big K because I know that I can get better tax benefits outside the four hundred one K than inside. But that created a hundred thousand dollar taxable income event for me. So one of the things that the government rewards investors is those people who help develop and produce energy whether it be coal or electricity or whatever. So I made a corresponding energy investment that completely offset, and not only offset that 100,000, but eliminated all my taxes completely in that year. And my, uh, my blog on this topic, you know, was that, uh, let's see, uh, what, what was it? Yeah. Yeah, but it was, I, I paid uh, no income tax in 2019. It was the same year that Trump paid 750. So I called him an underachiever because President Trump paid 750 dollars in taxes. I'm not sure why, but no. And I think that's a, a like a very interesting point to make, um, and, and something like very important to shed a light on and to bring attention to is that hey, if you understand the tax code, if you understand some of the tax rules, then you know you can use them to your advantage. Absolutely. You know, I, I, in, in the article that I wrote back then, I, I, there was, you know, there was some, you know, there were, I pulled some headlines, you know, 
out of the news, it's like, oh, well, you know, in America, there's, there's two tax laws, one for the rich and one for the poor. I'm not some guy who has, I'm just an average guy who, who, who does his homework. I do have a, one CPA and, and I was able to do this. So I would say there are two tax laws in the country, one for the people that study them and one for the people that don't. And frankly, I don't even study the tax laws. I've, I haven't, I've spent very little time in the tax code at all, but I, I read books and I listen to podcasts. I network with other investors. And you know, right now with President Biden proposing all these new tax laws, guess what we're doing? We're following that very closely to see what moves we're going to make depending on how the tax laws change. Because you know, for, for sophisticated investors, there's money to be made in every cycle. In an up cycle and a down cycle, there's an opportunity in either one. And you know, with these tax laws, we will find ways to handle that the best we can. And there'll be new incentives. You know, the, uh, you know green energy and renewable energy is probably going to get more of the tax benefits than the coal and oil did in the past, maybe. So maybe you know, investors will go where the incentives are. Exactly. Yes, sir. You, you're definitely making some great points. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I wanted to focus on, you know, you mentioned that, you know, you have your CPA, you have your, you know, your, your, um, group of investors that you meet up with and talk with and learn from and share knowledge and information with, you know, a little earlier, you mentioned that, you know, one of the biggest lessons that you, you took away from things is, is the importance of relationships and, and making those connections with people. So, you know, what would you say is the importance of having a good team and how did you focus on building your team? Well, uh, you just have to have one, you know, so you ha everybody has to decide what their expertise is, right? And so I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a CPA, I'm not a bookkeeper. Um, I, I try to focus on uh, finding where the, where the best investments are that match what I'm looking for. And that means that I have to have, you know, the bookkeeper and the CPA and, and the, the attorney that helps set up my entity. I mean, I can't, you know, it's not, that's not my specialty. Um, so you have to just, uh, my time is better uh, spent focusing on the things that I'm good at. I feel like I'm good teaching, I'm good at, I'm good at writing and, and making some of these complicated topics and bring them, down, bring them down to a simple level where people can go, oh yeah, okay, I see what he's talking about. I could, I could move in that direction. That makes a lot of sense. So I focus on that stuff and I hire the other stuff. And, and you know, I wasn't trained in any of that other stuff. I'll do it wrong, right? I would have never been able to pay no taxes if I was trying to do my tax return myself. No serious investor does his own taxes. Let me tell you that exactly. right now. <laughs> exactly. No, that's definitely a great point. Um, you know, when, uh, you know, I guess that just kind of also speaks to not being afraid to, not being, able, I'm sorry, not being afraid to take risks and just trying it, you know? So, um, what would you say to someone that may be, I guess, kind of hesitant about chasing their dreams or doing something that they're really interested in doing? What would you say to that person to motivate them to get up and get active? Um, you don't want to get I'm trying to think I'm trying to think of a saying um, um, you don't want to get to the end of your life with all these regrets the things you 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 know you could have should have would have done I mean uh, humans were made for for growth and achievement and and it doesn't matter what it is you know mine happens to be investing and there's a little benefit of you know making money doing that but um, whatever, whatever it is that you like to do, you know, be a musician, a singer, you know, a writer, an athlete, uh, go for it. I mean, what are we, what are we here to do if it's not to just, you know, continually, continually improve ourselves? Exactly. Yes, sir. And I couldn't agree with that more. So, you know, what would you say is your favorite aspect or your favorite part about being an entrepreneur? Well, I would, I would say, you know, I don't really consider myself you know, an entre entrepreneur very much. I mean, I'm an investor and uh, I mean, I don't go out and start businesses and things like that. Um, you know, doing this blog and writing this book is kind of about the most entrepreneurial thing I've ever done. Um, but I think it goes back to, uh, like I said about the staircase, I used to be the kind of guy that if I wanted to do X and there were 12 steps, I wouldn't start until I knew what all 12 steps are. I'm not that guy anymore. You know, I just, okay, I want to do that. Let's just get started. There's power. You know, it's the old, uh, 
uh, Newton's law, you know, a body in motion tends to stay in motion. Once you start moving, you're just going to keep moving and each little success is going to build on the next one. You don't need to know all 12 steps. You'll figure them out when you need to figure them out. Um, so that's one thing that I would say, uh, just get out there and get started, man. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And, you know, what would you say, I guess, is the single most important reason for your success, um, you know, since since firing the man, as you put it? <laughs> yeah. Well, let's go back even farther. So the the uh, the the I would go back to the point where I lost 55 percent of my assets. You know, how did how did I pick myself up from that? And uh, I would say you have to have a childlike curiosity about things in the world. Uh, there's an old saying where so somebody says, well, if it sounds too good to be true, it's probably not true. It probably is too good to be true. Well, I have, if I had followed that philosophy, I would have missed out on so many opportunities and, and missed out on making so much money. I mean, the, uh, the S&P 500 over its history has generated an average annual return of about 9.8%. But stock market investors, the average stock market investor studies have been done, they make about 5% before taxes and inflation. So when you add taxes and inflation, most people who are conventional investors aren't even maintaining their buying power. So with the day that somebody told me, hey, Chris, I routinely make 30% on my alternative investments, a lot of people would go, oh, come on. Nobody makes 30% returns on their investment. That sounds too good to be true. So it must not be true. I hear that and I start moving toward that instead of running away from that. I've got numerous examples where, um, you know, I mean, if you'd have told me that it was, you know, some, some, somebody says, well, uh, I have a, a conventional, uh, conventional wisdom quiz on my website and, and it uses a 10 question quiz. And one of the questions is, I should be giving this away. It's a trick question, right? One of the questions is true or false. Everything's, uh, nothing's certain except for death and taxes. Well, death is certain. Taxes are not certain anymore because I've proved it. I have paid no taxes, right? So uh, having a, a childlike curiosity, I think is really important. Yes, sir. I couldn't agree more. And, you know, just like you said, um, I feel like, you know, not having to know every step of the way before you take that step. You know, that's like the most important thing is like not being afraid of the unknown or not, or, or being comfortable being uncomfortable. I think that's an important yeah. uh, characteristic to have. Yeah. 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 yeah, sir. So, you know, how would you like for people to remember you and your company as well as your works? Well, I'd like to, you know, I, would just like to be known as a kind of an average guy who's very approachable. Uh, you know, I, I have a, a, a coffee cup on my website and every Thursday I have my schedule clear and anybody wants to sign up and have a free 30 minute virtual coffee with me and talk about investments. And so, and people do. So uh, I just want to be the, the guy that number one has real life experience and has knowledge and shares it and people are comfortable, you know, coming and talking money with me, which is, you know, one of those subjects that most people aren't very comfortable talking about. So it, exactly. And I think that the more we can have these open conversations about money and about alternative investments, this will make, uh, you know, it'll, it'll just spark new ideas and, and, and put new fire in people to, to, um, you know, have them want to go do their own research and get their own right. uh, alternative investment yeah can, can i share i want to share if you don't mind i want to share a really startling fact with with your audience that is just going to blow their mind right yes sir let's hear it <laughs> so the the conventional investing wisdom of you know saving for retirement in a 401k you know uh with stocks bonds and mutual funds that system is broken and it doesn't work for 92 percent of the population Wow. And, I'll, and I'll tell you why I know that. And, and isn't it amazing that that's, that's pretty, that, that has become the sole kind of retirement thing. Everybody maxes out their 401k. So the conventional investing wisdom has got two principles. Well, two of them are this balanced portfolio through a 401k. And then have you, have you ever heard of the 4% rule? Yes. So the 4% rule is 
is the is the the rule of thumb that financial advisors give to retirees and say 4% is how much you can withdraw every year and still have your money last as long as you're alive, right? Correct. So a lot of times people ask the question, I think it's a wrong question. Well, how much money, how much, how much, how big does this portfolio need to be? Does it need to be a quarter of a million, half a million, a million, whatever? But that's really the wrong question. The question is, what's, what retirement income do I want to have? So let's just say, let's just pick a hundred thousand dollars uh, and say, okay, let's say you want to retire or, or fire the man, whether that's at 30 or 40 or 50, whatever. And you want to have a hundred thousand dollar a year income. So you take that 100,000 and you divide it by the 4% rule. And that means your portfolio needs to be $2.5 million in order for that to work. So how many Americans become millionaires, much less multimillionaires, 8% of the population, right? So that's where I say 90, 92% of the population will never have a portfolio of a million dollars, much less two and a half. So let's, let's maybe we overshot a little bit with the, with the $100,000 income. The median income in the US is about $63,000. So if you took the 63,000 and you divide it by the 4%, you still get $1.1575 million. 92% of the people will never get there. So they won't, what I'm saying is, is this 401k system is broken and people are either going to have to reduce the quality of their lifestyle in retirement, or they're gonna to have to work longer. And what's happening is the, the advisors are no longer using 4%. Now they're starting to use three and a half or 3%. So now if you take that immediate income of 63,000 again, and you divide it by 3%, you're back up to $2.1 million. So that's why people need to be looking at alternatives because they just don't, they don't realize that they're most likely, I mean, hey, God bless everybody that's in that 8% and is a millionaire or more. But the problem is that's just not most of the country. And we need to think about what are we going to do for all those other people? But somehow they got to get there, right? And so that's why they need to look at alternative investments. No, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think, you know, the, the beauty of these alternative investments is just the cash flow that it creates for the people. Yeah. You know, so um, even if you are about to retire and you don't have that amount in in your 401k or what, wherever your, your savings vehicle is, you know, your assets can still produce that cash flow for you. So you can still live the life that you want to live. Yeah. And the bottom line is you don't, if, if you have cash flowing investments, you don't need as much, exactly. you don't need as many assets. You need less assets because you're not cannibalizing your asset every year. You can't sell off a, one of the units in the apartment building. You have the apartment building. It's probably growing in value and giving you cash to live on all at the same time. So that's where people need to be moving. Exactly. Yes, sir. So, you know, what does the future of the prolific investor look like to you? Um, well, I would like to keep doing what I'm doing. I keep writing, uh, writing the articles. I don't think that the, I, I think I need to uh, not, I'm not going to write another book for a while, even though I've got another one I would like to write. Uh, I heard a guy on a podcast talk about uh, serial authors. They write book number one, then they write book number two. Then they, he said, look, write the book and then spend the next five years making that book successful, right? And, and reap the, fr the fruits of your labor. Don't pull out another one. She so said, man, you put the time and the effort into that book, make that book successful, make it popular and get more people off there. You know what? And uh, manage your money with alternative investments. Exactly. So, um, so I'll, be, I'll be on the podcast circuit. Um, I would love to be on a speaking circuit. Uh, you know, there might be an opportunity to turn this book into into an online class for people that, that uh, you know, that might be a better learning style for them. So so we'll see. Um, I'm hoping the book will kind of open some doors and maybe show me uh, uh, kind of what some other possible paths might be for me in the future. But I don't have any definite plans. No, that's amazing. And I think that's a really great piece of advice, too, is, you know, you, you spent your time working and crafting and creating the book. So why not spend the next five years making it successful? Uh, that's, that's really uh, beneficial for me, especially hearing that. So I, I appreciate that valuable information for sure. Yeah, cool, man. Yeah. 
Yes, sir. Well, Chris, thank you so much for your time today. I've definitely learned a lot, and I definitely um, am interested in, in in reading and learning more about your book and, and what it is that you offer. But before we get out of here, at the end of every podcast, we like to play a rapid-fire question game where I ask you three questions. So if okay. you're willing to play, I'll go ahead and ask. You betcha. Yes, sir. Question number one. Where's your favorite place to travel? I would like, I would like to go back to Kenya, Kenya. on safari. That's dope. That's super dope. Why <laughs> Kenya? Uh, well, just any place, any place on the African continent where you could see the wildlife. It could be Kenya. I've been there. Or, uh, and, you know, there's some, but I would, I would love to go back and do another safari. For sure. For sure. That's awesome. What song explains your life the most? <laughs> How about I did it either the Elvis version or the Frank Sinatra version? <laughs> hey, I'm, a, I'm a Frank Sinatra fan. Frank Sinatra is dope. <laughs> yeah, I like that. <laughs> All right. And look, final question. Yep. What's an amazing thing that you did that no one was around to see? Hmm. Amazing thing that I did that no one was around to see. Well, you know, when I walked on the Great Pyramids of Giza, you know, nobody was there with me, at least nobody that I knew anyway. And that's <laughs> so, pretty cool. How was that experience? How was that experience for you? It was uh, it was it was both both the Kenya experience and, and, and the Egypt experience were both surreal. You know, the start started in, start in Nairobi in the city. You know, you're driving out, you're going out into the bush. And all of a sudden, it's you're, it's like you're in a television. All of a sudden, you there's giraffes running in the field beside you, you know, and uh, and then just in the same thing, uh, uh, driving out of Cairo, and all of a sudden, there it is, the Great Pyramid of Giza. You know, stuff that you know most people only see in a movie, you know. So just that that kind of stuff is just uh, and walking on the Great Wall of China, you know. So. That yeah, kind sir, of no, that, that's definitely awesome. Well, Chris, thank you so much for your time today. I really enjoyed this conversation. Hey, before we before we go, I need to let people know how to get a hold of me. Um, uh, You're best right. way, my apologies. <laughs> no worries. Best way is at the website theprolificinvestor.net, and there's a few ways that people can interact with me. We mentioned a couple of them. There's the conventional wisdom quiz, and there's the virtual coffees. Uh, there's articles, videos, all kinds of resources, podcasts, books that I've read. And there's a there's a big green star flashing there that says the book is now available. So if you uh, if you go to the prolific investor dot that'll drive you easiest way to get to the Amazon site if you want to check out that book. And the ebook right now is still on special for only 99 cents. So, you know, it's a real bargain. <laughs> yes, sir. That's amazing. That's awesome. That's awesome. So everybody make sure you go check out Chris every way possible. Hey, thanks for having me on, uh, Wesley. I really appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun. Yes, sir. Thank you.